Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Cotswold Canal Trust's um, water transfer webinar. Um, I'll introduce Ken Bergen in a minute, who many of you will already know. We have 99 people at the moment on the webinar. Uh, I'll just run through the housekeeping. Uh, uh, and first, so I'm Amy Malcolm. I'm Cotswold Canal Trust's ambassador. And today we have with us Lisa Mant also. We will be managing the question and answer process at the end of this webinar. Uh, uh, you will not be able to use the chat function on this webinar, but you can post any questions you do have for Ken, and he will try to answer as many as he can live for you. Uh, are those that he can't answer, we will make sure that there's a frequently asked questions um, a post after the webinar, along with a recording of the webinar. Um, so all of your videos will be turned off uh, and we are going to be recording this session. Enjoy the webinar. I'm sure we're all going to learn a lot about water transfer and I'm going to hand over to Ken. Hi, right, good evening everybody and, um, and welcome to the webinar this evening. Um, this is the first time I've done a webinar. I'm more used to live audiences, so I'm not going to be able to get the sort of visual feedback as to whether you're you're finding it interesting or bored to death. So please do bear with us. Uh, we'll do our best. I'm going to start the screen share next because that's the uh, that's the next most important thing. And then there's a presentation and uh, the Q and A. We'll have a go at answering the questions at the back end. Right, hopefully you can see that. Um, all right, then. on with the on with the on with the show, so to speak. That looks fine, Ken. We can see everything. Uh, right, so um, we'll start off with the re for some of the reasoning behind why water transfer is even useful um, as a starting point. Um, you can see there a map of the. Uh, of, of basically the main part of uh, England, Scotland and Wales, and you can see on it various different colours. Um, with the darker the colour, the more rainfall there is. Um, and then you can see on the uh, on the southeast of the country, that's where the least rainfall falls. If you look at a population map, um, you can see there's uh, an awful lot of people in the southeast, including, of course, the capital. So you've got the demand in the bottom right hand corner of the uh, of the country and you've got the uh, the rainfall largely where that isn't um, on the other side. Now analyses have been done as to how much water is needed in the southeast and this is uh, this comes off of the WRSC water resources southeast uh, slideshow and it basically shows an increasing deficit um, going between uh, 2025 right up to 2100. Um, and you can see really that it gets worse and worse and worse as time goes on. And we are kind of at the point where there's not quite enough water in a, in, in a drought, in drought conditions um, with one in a hundred years. Now trying to get it so that uh, um, the London and the Southeast will be resilient to one in 500 year droughts. And that's driving some very big figures. Now, when it comes to the Cotswold Canal set, uh, seven Thames transfer scheme, um, there's some things that have happened. Um, this is not a new scheme. We've been talking about it um, in some detail since a public inquiry in 2010. Um, it has been established by people other than the Cotswold Canals Trust that the canal could deliver 300 million litres a day. Um, and the scheme has gone through the WRSE gate one. Now there was actually a gate two, which is coming up this year. Uh, gate three is more design and gate four is basically uh, takes it to shovel ready. Um, the 300 million litres a day is not needed all the time. That's when water is short in the southeast. And at other times, um, the scheme can be throttled right back. But even when it's switched off, there does need to be a thing called a sweetening flow, and that's 20 to 30 million litres a day. Um, and that is enough to actually run the navigation. 
So this doesn't just provide water, or it wouldn't just provide water at the time uh, when London and the southeast were short. There would always be enough water to run the canal. Um, those of you that have been following this for a while will also know that um, Thames Water much prefer using a much longer pipeline rather than the canal for, all, for several reasons that seem good to them, uh, but not necessarily good for us. Now, there's been a lot of talk about a water grid and contour canals and things like that, but, but a seven Thames transfer allows effectively a virtual water grid. Uh, the map on the left shows things as they are now. And um, there is basically, at the moment, water goes to the United Utilities area in the northwest from Lake Vernwy in Wales. Um, and also at Minworth, there is a sewage works for Birmingham and the water from that, when it's cleaned up, goes into the River Trent. Now, if you look at the map on the right, this could be changed a bit so that United Utilities in the northwest got more of its water from elsewhere. And the water that currently goes northwest from Lake Fern, we can go down the River Severn um, and then go across through ideally the canal, of course, into the River Thames to supply London and the southeast and the reservoirs down there. Um, similarly, with Minworth, the water that goes to the Trent, in theory, could be put into the River Avon, get into the Severn and then across. And this shows this in a little bit more detail. Um, there isn't enough water coming, or there wouldn't be enough water coming down the River Severn in a drought to just simply pick it up and take it across the country and send it to London and the Southeast. It needs to be supplied by other water, Lake Vernwy being one of the, uh, the bigger options, but there are other things that can be done to put more water in the Severn compared with now. Um, in order to, uh, to provide the water necessary or available to be transferred across. Um, the other thing you can see on this map is the two different interconnectors that are proposed. There's the, um, there's the pipeline, which is the one to the north, that's this one here. Um, and then to the south, there is the Cotswold Canals. And the thing to note the difference of is the amount of pipe work involved. Um, if you compare the canal scheme with the uh, pipeline scheme, the grey dotted line is the pipeline going right the way, way across from Deerhurst on the Severn, right up over the top of the Cotswolds, and then down to, uh, to a point downstream of Oxford. The Cotswold Canal scheme would involve only a short pipeline at the western end to take the water from the Gloucester and Sharpness uh, to Newtown, the Stington, then in Canal to Ryford, and then in another pipeline from Ryford through to the summit level. There's more on that later. It then flows by gravity down the canal on the eastern side and uh, ideally into the Thames at Letchlade. There is still some debate, argument on whether that eastern stretch of the pipeline is necessary to bypass the Thames. If we look in a little bit more detail at the western end of our canal, um, the water for the transfer would come down the Gloucester and Sharpness Canal. Um, that will come in at Gloucester. There's already pumps at Gloucester that supply Bristol water. Those plus others would be needed to get up to the full capacity of the scheme. Um, and as I say, it would bypass the first set of locks. It's worth putting it in the canal from Newtown to, um, to Ryford. It's about four kilometres. At uh, Ryford, you would have an infiltration system, certainly in the scheme that, that we're proposing. Um, that would get rid of any eggs and um, uh, bugs and, and invasive species that would otherwise get to the Thames. It then gets pumped all the way from Ryford in a pipe, right the way up to the summit level. And ideally, from our point of view, and I'll explain this later, through the base of the tunnel to come out on the eastern side. Now that pipeline doesn't have to follow the canal or be in the towpath. And one of the things that the consulting engineers for WRSC did point out is that it's quite difficult to get a perhaps a 1.3 meter diameter pipe 
uh, through the middle of Stroud. And um, in response to that, we looked at some alternatives. And uh, this, this map below, it's quite difficult to see the detail, but at the left, left hand side of it is Ryford. Um, there's a major power substation there. Um, the treatment works can go in that area. And then you could take a pipeline from there, go through the fields parallel with the, um, the Ebony Bypass. There's a short stretch where you'll have to uh, bore it underneath properties, and then it could pick up the, uh, the disused uh, railway track, the old Midlands railway track, get round Stroud without having to dig up any roads or anything like that, and then make its way up to, uh, up to the summit that way. Now uh, that could avoid an awful lot of, uh, a lot of problems. When you get on the eastern side, it gets somewhat easier. The water's in the canal and it's all downhill from there. Um, you'd need bypass weirs to go around the Siddington flight, the South Cerny flight, and individual weirs around the other locks. Um, and to give you an idea of the size of the weirs, they would probably be similar in length to the one at Dubbridge, about 27 metres. And um, they don't have to carry as much water as the Dubbridge one carries in a flood, uh, probably only a fifth as much. Um, but that would be roughly the size of the overflow weirs to make sure that when the transfer was running, you didn't end up with too big a level difference. And on the longer pounds, there will be a slight slope. The water will be deeper at the upstream end than the downstream end. Um, and that is because of the, uh, the slope necessary to create the flow. Now, there's been some questions about, well, how does this work in the situation where you've got a canal with a flow on it? And I thought it was worth putting in a slide to give a bit of a feel for, the, uh, for what's involved. And there are several cross sections on this. Uh, the one in the top left shows the nominal cross section of the Stroud Water Canal, the Thames and Severn Canal uh, west of Brimscombe. But interestingly, the summit level of the Thames and Severn Canal was built wider and deeper as well. And that was so that it would store water. They actually tried to use the summit level as a reservoir on, on the Thames and Severn Canal. Wasn't overly successful as such, but what it does mean is that we have a wider and deeper channel than, uh, than the rest of the canal that then basically goes down um, uh, through, uh, through Siddington and down to the Thames at Inglesham. And similarly, the, the canal in the Golden Valley, which won't be used for water transfer, is the same sort of size. But um, you're, looking, uh, you're looking at 18-ish square metres, taking reeds into account for the, uh, for the summit level. And you're looking at about nine square metres um, of cross section on the eastern part of the canal. Although some of the brand new sections that we're expecting to build and those where it has to be reconstructed we are expecting the canal to be wider than the original. Now, the real fun starts when you get to something like a bridge hole where the canal is designed only to take one boat at a time. Now, many of these bridges are at the tail of locks, so it won't matter because they'll be bypassed by the lock bypass system. But where this occurs, you've got generally about five meters of width and about 1.25 meters of water, giving only 6.25 square meters. Um, although that can be increased by, for example, putting a large diameter pipe underneath the towpath. Um, now, if you take that small cross section under the bridge, um, that would result in a flow of about two kilometers an hour underneath that bridge. And in the rest of the canal, it's likely to be nearer one kilometer. And that would give you the 300 million liters a day. So, um, it's not a very high speed. When you bear in mind that the speed limit on canals in this country is about six kilometers an hour, um, that is not a very fast flow rate. And it is not at all unusual to find that sort of flow rate in rivers. Um, you know, for example, at the western end of the canal where the river shares the, um, the Froome in the last bit down to Whitminster Lock, we're gonna see flows of that sort of level quite often. Now, there is a problem, though. Um, a bridge hole is one thing because it's very short, but the tunnel is a different matter completely. And this shows what would happen if you had a fat, deep, wide beam boat going into, into Sapperton Tunnel. Um, 
On the left at the top, you can see the tunnel cross section. Um, on the right, you can see what it looks like when you put in a fat deep wide beam. And as you can see, the amount of volume or space around the boat is pretty limited. Uh, so if you imagine a big fat wide beam boat going into a Sapperton tunnel, going through the Coates portal, um, it's not going to be very long before you end up with a slope because water is still be coming in from the transfer if you were to put it through the tunnel rather than under it, uh, would still be coming through the transfer from the western end and it would be draining away over the weir, weirs at the, uh, at the eastern end. So um, as that boat went into the tunnel, the water level in front of it would rise and the water level behind it would drop and probably long before it came out the other end, you'd end up with a situation where the boats actually reached a point of, uh, of being completely stationary. And then when it runs out of fuel, it would come out backwards on a low tsunami. So the tunnel is a special case, and there are other places where we need to bear this phenomena in mind. Um, but uh, the tunnel's by far and away the most extreme one. Now, there is another scheme um, which basically we put forward as part of uh, part of an exercise a couple of years ago when WRSC were looking for new and alternative sources of water for the um, for the southeast. And they were interested in anything that could deliver more than one million litres of water a day. So that's only a third of a percent of the seven Thames transfer scheme. And um, we lobbed in a suggestion of using or creating reservoirs that we need for the canal anyway, or at least some of them, at the eastern end of the canal and using that to supply the canal and to provide water to London and the southeast. And we estimated, depending on just how much reservoir capacity could be created, that you might get 10 to 20 million litres a day from such a scheme. And if you actually only took it out when you really needed it in a drought, you can get higher volumes. And these would uh, these reservoirs would be created from um, dug out gravel pits close to the canal in the Latin and Cernewick area. These not not the existing lakes. These would be lake. These would be new holes that are almost certainly going to be dug anyway as the uh, as the gravel is extracted. And that shows roughly where in the scheme of things it would be. So the, um, the eastern end of the Thames and Seven plus these reservoirs would form that, um, uh, that resource. And if you have the time to read all the way through all the annexes in the WRSC thing, you'll see it is actually mentioned briefly in Annex 4 as a multi-sector scheme. And of the multi-sector schemes that are identified, it is by far and away the biggest one. So this scheme is still on the table. Um, and it's not incompatible with the uh, with the big water transfer scheme. Um, just to give you an idea how such a reservoir could be created, um, some of the writing's too small to read easily on this, but it's uh, you would have the main reservoir in the middle, but you would have around it effectively a wildlife canal, not a navigable one. And what this would do is to intercept groundwater on the uh, upstream side to take it around the, the reservoir and decant it on the downstream side. And that uh, that would be designed specifically for wildlife enhancements and habitats. The reservoir itself has some habitat value, but of course, to be useful, a reservoir the, in a reservoir, the water level needs to change, uh, uh, change between when it's full and when it's empty. So you end up with uh, big dry sides, which are far less valuable ecologically. So this attempts to do both. Um, this is just a preliminary uh, preliminary design, but it gives a bit of a feel for, for how it would work. Okay, I did say previously that, um, that, that the Eastern Reservoir Scheme wasn't incompatible with the transfer scheme. And the reason for that is that that additional resource could still be made available, um, but it can also act as a buffer. So if you've got the main 300 megalitre a day transfer running and then there was a pollution incident, for example, or a pump breakdown somewhere at the western end, uh, those reservoirs could be used to keep the transfer going to London until it's fixed and then it's business as usual. Now, moving on to the, uh, to the current consultation, it finishes on Monday. So if... Uh, 
If you haven't written in yet and you're watching this, please do. The email addresses are given later. Um, and this plan is an emerging plan. What, what has happened is that they've picked up largely work that was done under the water, water resource management plans for six water companies in the southeast in 2019. And they picked the least cost solutions for them and they've tried to create an emerging plan uh, based upon that. Now, a least cost plan is not what is actually wanted by anybody in this. The, what is being looked for is a best value plan. And best, the difference between the two is really in the best value, because what's regarded as best value are things that deliver additional benefits such as an environment or social benefits. And this consultation is going to be very, or well, the outcome of this consultation will very heavily affect what the best value plan looks for. And the best value plan we want, obviously, is one that's got the canal in it. Um, as a water transfer route, because that's the way to get the eastern side of the canal restored sooner rather than later. Now, the emerging plan, um, the key elements in it are that for the 20 to 20, 2025 to 2040 time frame is to start to build the big Abingdon Reservoir in 2025, right at the beginning of the period, and it may be ready at the end, i.e. at 2040. Um, the other elements of the, of, of the emerging plan involve the expensive energy hungry wastewater and desalination processing plants. Um, it's exceedingly difficult to see what environmental or social benefits are going to come from such things. And they are more expensive. It says again in, within the documentation that the reservoir and the seven times transfer schemes are cheaper than wastewater and desalination plants. But rather bizarrely, it is wastewater and desalination that have been put into the early part of the plan um, to run alongside the Abingdon Reservoir, which itself will take 15 years to build. However, if you look carefully in the plan, you'll see that they are planning to start to build a seven times transfer probably in the 2030s anyway, because they think that it's likely to need to be available by around 2040. Um, the plan goes on in 2040 to introduce various other schemes, um, but all but the most optimistic scheme, uh, scenarios in terms of water demand do have a 7 times transfer. Um, the pipeline or the canals really are to be decided. In 2019, they went for the, uh, or Thames Water, who were responsible for looking after the, their own water at that point, wanted to build the pipeline, but that was not against the criteria of the best value plan. And costing work on the canal and the, uh, well, certainly on the canal is still ongoing. We know this. Right, so what does best value mean? Well, it's supposed to be, uh, it's supposed to fully bring environmental and social benefits into the picture. So it's not a matter of saving money, it's a matter of getting best overall value. It's got to take carbon into account, should encapsulate customer and stakeholder aspirations. And that is what this consultation is all about. But it does not have to be least cost. And the emerging plan is not going to be the best value plan. It, doesn't look like a best value plan. And Water Resources Southeast fully understand that and state that. So there is the opportunity to have changes. Now, what do we need to do? Um, we need to point out uh, the, these environmental and social benefits and the cultural benefits and the heritage benefits and all the other things that come with using the canal instead of building uh, wastewater reuse plants, um, or even the reservoir for that matter. Um, and certainly building a pipeline doesn't deliver you very much either. Um, and clearly, the question has to be asked is what possible environmental or social benefits come from a wastewater or desalination plant? And 
the email will be put up later on, but the best way to get this in is to email in to that email address. You can try and do the online survey if you want, but it covers everything <coughs> from kind of what you feel about water leakage and all sorts of other stuff. Um, but if you want to talk about, and it doesn't really give much of an opportunity to talk about the canal, um, but the point we want to be made by as many people as possible is that the canal makes sense, please go and do it. And the number of people who do that is important because as has been the case in previous um, previous consultations in the in the water resource management plan programs, um, there has been a very high number of people commenting about the desirability of the plan to the point that it has been one of the main issues. It is very, very important that it remains that way and that it's perceived by everybody that it remains important. Now, what are we doing? Well, um, CCT will be putting in an, a detailed um, critique of the, uh, of the emerging plan, pulling out as evidence information from the annexes in, and from the plan itself to point out why it makes sense to do the canal and going into detail why. So if you're just writing in, you don't need to repeat, reproduce all of that. Uh, you can make your own points in your own way. Um, but it's important that you do that, even if it's a couple of sentences. Um, we are already uh, raising awareness uh, through and with political contacts. Um, interestingly, there was even a house in uh, even a question in Prime Minister's question time today in the middle of the Ukrainian crisis about the undesirability of the Abingdon Reservoir. Um, and uh, assurances were given, of course, by the Prime Minister that it's all going to be looked into carefully. And that's where we come in. Um, and we are seeking support and publicity locally and nationally. So the, 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 um, the information's there. It will appear later as well for the um, uh, for Water Resource South England. It's in, it's in all the emails that have gone out in the trove. But a health warning, if you go for the uh, online form, you have to register for it. And most of it's not going to be about the canal. Um, but if you just email into that, then it counts just as much. Um, that will come up again later on. Um, I'm going to go on now a little and um, say a little bit about what's actually happening at the moment um, in terms of the development of the, uh, of the scheme. So what is happening at the moment, as we speak even, is that Mott McDonald, which are the consulting engineers that are doing the work, have been tasked by WIRC with costing up the restoration of the whole canal and what else is needed to make it act as a water transfer scheme. So that information will become available. And we know this because they're asking us about it and we're looking for information. And the big the big thing that's cropping up is, OK, what is it going to take to make the eastern and summit level of the canal watertight? Um, that is a question that we've not really looked at in a great deal of depth before. And to give you an idea of some of the problems, um, CMRT can spend up to £20,000 a linear metre. That's what a bit on the Swansea Canal is costing. Now, the Wendover Canal Trust, using volunteers, is spending £450 a linear metre. Now, we've got 40-odd kilometre of canal here that needs may need relining and whether it does or it doesn't is not a simple question either and that makes the difference between 800 million and 18 million um, so optimizing how the canal would be relined and finding out how much of it actually needs relining is actually a rather important question because nobody's going to want to spend 800 million 18 might be doable um, and for that reason, this is not a comprehensive set of uh, pictures and it's not uh, necessarily very easy to, uh, to, to interpret, but it gives a bit of a flavour for the state of various bits of canal. And what we've done is we've colour coded sections of canal as to whether they're green, i.e. they're heavily silted, um, or whether they've basically got, a, got reeds in the beds of the bottoms, uh, the bottoms watertight, but the sides are shot. 
Um, other ones where besides the shop, the bottom shop, things are growing it, there's holes in it where badgers and rabbits and goodness knows what have dug in it. And then on the right hand side, there are various um, various other things showing possible uh, restoration techniques using uh, using uh, the clay uh, clay lining but supported so that local clay can be used or possibly a synthetic uh, liner spray concreted and so forth so there's various things there and then the ultimate horror is the summit level and um, this is where water pressure in the winter can cause water to push the clay lining up leaving holes through which the water then pours and then you add on to that 100 or more years of the canal being dry and you've got trees growing in it and you've still got badger holes and all the rest of it you can start to see that on some of those stretches it's going to need something like a concrete section a bit like the king's reach um, but hopefully there won't be too much of that um, the thing you have to remember with all these linings is, is if you've got groundwater that is higher than the uh, than, than the uh, canal bed um, particularly if that canal bed hasn't got water in it, then things are either going to break through or if you put in a concrete section, unless it's extremely thick and heavy, it will float. So you'll see on the bottom of those two diagrams is actually got um, some, uh, some basically some uh, sc screw type devices to hold it down to stop it floating. Now, Mott McDonald are using some quantity surveyors to uh, to review all of this and to come up with some costings as to what it would cost for a contractor to do all this work. Um, we're awaiting that with some interest and will doubtless get the opportunity to comment upon it uh, when it's available. Um, if you take all of that into account and all the bridges and all the locks and all the rest of it, we're looking at a base cost of probably somewhere between 150 and 200 million um, pounds. Um, for the 26 miles of the canal and the locks and the tunnel. Um, and that assumes that contractors do the work. It excludes design risk contingency and inflation. Um, and uh, it also excludes the specific water supply and transfer infrastructure. That would be the invasive um, species filters, the pumps, the pipelines, and all the rest of it. Now, that might sound like a heck of a lot of money, but these schemes tend to cost billions. And it does say somewhere in one of the annexes that the difference in cost between basically a 710s transfer and doing the same thing with wastewater uh, reuse plants is of the order of a billion pounds. That's the difference, not the absolute cost. So, okay, if it's 150 to 200 million of base costs on this, that isn't necessarily a showstopper when it's taken, when everything's taken into account. Now, there would still, I'm sure, be an opportunity for volunteer restoration, and it will save some costs. But the thing to bear in mind with this scheme is that they will expect to start this and finish it within about seven years. And if you look at the number of locks that we've still got to restore, if we were to do one lock a year, we're probably talking 40 plus years just to do the locks. So. Volunteers may well be able to do some really good and very interesting restoration projects, but it's not the solution to getting the whole canal restored um, anytime soon. So it would supplement rather than be fundamental. And that's, uh, that's a real, real opportunity there. Um, going back to the time scales, it does say in the, uh, or it says not, uh, not sure if it says it in the documentation that is, um, easily available to find, but the estimates I've seen for getting a seven Thames transfer open based on the Cotswolds canals is of the order of seven years, maybe eight. Now we did query that because the amount of time they were going to take to restore the canal using contractors was actually longer than it took the people in the 18th century to build the whole thing from scratch by hand, starting at one end and working their way through to the other. So we've suggested that, that the amount of time they were assuming can't be right, because unlike the original canal builders, there's nothing to stop you to in doing this all in parallel and working on long lengths of it simultaneously. You don't have to start at one end and work your way through. Um, now, a water reuse, uh, a desalination plant or water reuse apparently will take about six years. So, OK, you might be able to gain a year 
um, getting some water. The other thing is, is that the reservoir is going to take 15 years. And if instead of trying to solve your problem in 2040 or having to wait until 20 water, 2040 for the water that would be available from the reservoir, you did a seven Thames transfer using the canal scheme first, you would get that water a lot earlier and you could either delay the reservoir or you may get away without the uh, water reuse plants and desalination. It may not be quite that simple, but there is another thing that you can do with the canal, which you can't do with the desalination plant and you can't do with the reservoir either. And that is that you can do some of the work and start to transfer a lower volume of water, maybe 100 million litres a year, which is the order of the amount of water they would get from the way waste water reuse uh, plants, you can get that early and then you can build up to the 300 million litres a day doing the other modifications and mitigations that you would have to do to cope with the higher volumes. So unlike a lot of these schemes, um, the canal scheme is able to, uh, to, to build up slowly. The other nice thing with the canal scheme, as I said before, is that when you don't need 300 million litres of water a day, you can switch it off or at least throttle it back 90%. Um, I don't think you can do that with a, uh, with a desalination plant because if they're not working flat out, they tend to deteriorate. So it's much, much more difficult to, um, to, to throttle back a desalination plant. And of course, it's a very expensive and energy hungry way of getting water. And you really don't want to be doing it when it's flooding outside and it's pouring with rain in the middle of January or February. So it's not a particularly flexible um, or cheap way to produce water. Desalination plants, certainly previously, they were going to use the same technology. It may be that they've got something a bit better now. But if but there do seem to be some technological uncertainty on some of the wastewater stuff. And if you do go with the, um, with the canal scheme, seven times transfer first, it gives longer to refine those techniques and possibly cost reduce them. So there's all sorts of uh, all sorts of stuff in there. Um, we've got to the point now where we're going to go over to the question and answers. Um, I'll just put up once again the uh, the contact details. And um, as you've probably gathered, there's a huge amount of depth to this that we could go into, um, but uh, we're trying to keep this to about an hour. So uh, we'll pass it over to you guys to um, to to ask questions. Thank you very much, Ken. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, we've now got 139 guests online. Um, we've had some questions come in. So just to remind people, if they use the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen, you can type answers and myself and Lisa will um, relay as many as we can to Ken within the next uh, uh, few, uh, wee while. So we're about 15 minutes, I'd say, Ken, for question and answers, if that's all right with you. That's absolutely fine. Excellent. We've had, uh, we've had um, two questions that come into a, a similar uh, vein uh, around the Environment Act and the, um, the systems that um, these uh, consultations uh, and procurement processes use for measuring social value. Um, and uh, we've done a huge piece of work on phase one around economic impact um, uh, using um, the Stantec report. But also we've all, um, we know that the, the, the Environment Act brought in the measurement around biodiversity net gain and that what we're learning on phase one around working through that metric uh, um, so it, it's, it's really questions, they're not particularly questions, they're more statements, as how are we considering those things and what are we going, how does that work in line with the, our Cotswold Canals Trust water transfer project? Right, okay. Um, that's all very important stuff and uh, as is very much the case with phase 1b, it's possible to demonstrate that you can get massive biodiversity net gains uh, through um, canal restoration if it's done properly. Um, that I don't think is lost upon 
WRSE, and it certainly won't be by the time they get our response, which uh, definitely refers to uh, both the um, both the economic and the um, and the biodiversity net gain side of things. Um, the buzzword is natural capital. Okay, that's the uh, that's the buzzword for the um, uh, for the uh, uh, um, environmental act twenty five year plan. Um, and the definition of natural capital explicitly includes canals. The fact they're man-made doesn't mean that they've got no natural capital. So um, that will all be taken into account. And uh, then that will be factored into the plan. Now, they, the interesting problem is that one person's best value and whether it's worth 100 million quid or not is different to the opinion of somebody else. One of the big jobs we've got to do is to try to get them to understand um, that it is worth the extra and to, in particular, to get them to understand that the canal restoration is something that people really want. And I'll give you a simple example. Um, the normal attitude towards a big capital construction project is that it's going to be a nuisance and the local, uh, local community will hate it and therefore it comes in as a big negative. When, when it's assessed. Now, if you think back to this canal and think of the big projects, putting in the roundabout, uh, putting in the bridge in the middle of Stroud or the A38 roundabout bridges um, uh, recently and now the railway bridge, what you actually get is a huge amount of public interest, huge amounts of public support and lots of people wanting to see it being done. And the reason they want to see it being done is because it's an incremental step towards getting this canal restored. Now, we've got to persuade people that some of the things that they regard as bad are actually regarded by the people who they're concerned about as largely good. Um, so it depends on what the outcome is. Um, but similarly, this scheme, the Cotswold Canal's uh, seven, uh, seven Thames transfer scheme, has got the capacity not to just offset its own function, but also some of the other things that they're doing that have no real capacity for um, social or natural or, or environmental gains um, so that they're offsetting some of the other things they're doing against the value that they're getting from this scheme or the benefits and that will that considerably assists with justifying it being done. Thank you Ken. Um, we've got lots more questions coming in. Um, there's what, an interesting question here has the potential commercial model been considered, i.e. who is responsible for ongoing delivery of water? Is it CCT, i.e. us, the charity, or will it be Thames Water? All of the water needed to run the canal should be pretty much incidental to the, uh, to the transfer. Um, so we're not, if, if this scheme was to go ahead, we're expecting it to essentially solve the water supply problems for the canal. Um, it may not be quite as straightforward as that, but we are not responsible for shipping 300 million litres to solve London and the South East problems. That comes with the water companies and the, uh, the leisure benefits of the canal are incidental to that. It is likely that if this scheme goes ahead, that the whole Cotswold canals will be integrated into the rest of the canal network under Canal and River Trust. Not inevitable, but it's most likely um, because uh, the, the sheer importance and value of the link in its dual purpose is such that um, there would be a great deal of uh, focus on, on it being maintained to a very high standard. Now, that doesn't mean that volunteers can't get involved because, of course, they do on other Canal and River Trust um, schemes. But I think to give the confidence that people are looking for, that is likely to be the outcome. Thank you, Ken. Um, so have another, um, I, I, I always like questions that include Sabton Tunnel. Um, so I'm going to ask this one. Uh, with the max flow through the tunnel, won't this make it heavy going to take a barge through towards Stroud? Well, I did cover that and I said that the what we are proposing, and in fact, this was something that was proposed by 
an, a consultant engineer working for Thames Water back in 2010 at the original public inquiry, and we adopted it from that point. If you put the transfer water in a pipe under the base of the tunnel, and remember that this tunnel needs a new base anyway, because half of it's missing if it's in Fuller's Earth because it got pushed up by the Fuller's Earth, or if it's in rocket leaks, so it needs, needs a concrete liner or something like that. If you put the pipe in the base of the tunnel, you do not end up with a flow in the tunnel itself. Um, and that is, what, that, that is what we are suggesting and advocating. If that wasn't to happen, then I think it would be extremely difficult for wide, deep drafted boats to go east to west. Now, because and I showed you the cross section that that involves. If you have a narrow boat, on the other hand, that doesn't draw over a metre in depth and is about half the width of the tunnel, then the situation is different. There would be quite a flow um, because the water's got to get past the boat, but you're only occluding, you know, maybe a third of the cross section rather than perhaps 80 or 90 percent of it. So it may well be possible. Um, that discussion has been touched on a few times with the engineers and there may be workarounds, um, but our preferred solution would be to avoid any current in the tunnel at all, um, because we think that would be the best solution. But there may be possibilities of switching it off for a couple of hours for east to west tra uh, traffic and things like that, but uh, that would be second best. Thank you, Ken. Um, this is, I think, you you cut you did cover this in your presentation, so apologies for repeating. Um, but it's 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 actually quite a, an important point, I feel, that the um, uh, we have uh, somebody online with us um, who attended the consultation in Thames Water in February two thousand and eighteen. Uh, and um, there was a there was a real sense in the room that the the consultation didn't want to really be party to you know third party um, ambition. Uh, so do you think that this position has really moved on since then in your estimation? It's, it's quite a fair point, I think. It is, and it has. It, it's moved on for two reasons. Or at least the first reason of course is, to, uh, um, is reinforced by the second. The government has given up leaving the individual water companies to say and do just what they want. They've gone from a, from a water company by water company approach into one where they basically said, right, Water Resource Southeast, which covers six water companies, um, needs to look at the thing as a whole job. Okay, and uh, in doing so, it means that you don't, for example, have one water company spending three times as much getting some water when you could have used a scheme that was rejected by the water company next door um, because they had a, a, a slightly cheaper or better scheme. So they're mixing everything into the pot as one great thing, and then they're basically trying to pull out of it the best, uh, the best options. The other thing that's changed is that up until this time around, it was very much least cost that was king. There was some nominal acknowledgement that, um, that uh, um, there may be some value in doing things slightly differently if there was some advantage, but this time best values built into it. Now, the second thing is, is that way back in 2020, um, they were doing consultation, Water Resource Southeast was doing consulta consultations onto the methodology that they would use to decide what best value is. Now, this isn't one of the world's most riveting subjects, but it's one that I engaged with um, and uh, made quite a lot of points and quite a lot of those have been built into the evaluation system. Now, there's still a risk that, you know, kind of one pound fifty is the is too much to pay for something that's best value. Um, but as I say, we don't know that's going to be tested this time around, but it is, a, it is more of a political decision and it isn't up to an individual water company to say, well, I prefer a pipe because I know what a pipe is and I don't like canals because that's something I'm not used to. That option, I think, is much less likely to, uh, to hold sway now than it was before. I'm not saying it won't happen, and I'm not sure, saying it, people won't try, 
And we may yet find ourselves in the consultation later this year when we're saying, well, you didn't listen to the last consultation. We wanted the canal scheme, but you've gone and put something in the, in the, in the programme that's nothing like as good. Um, this consultation is actually not a formal one as part of the process. The next one may well be. So there are some more bites at the cherry, but I'm hoping that by the next one, we're congratulating them on making the right decisions rather than fighting against the wrong decisions. But we do have some quite uh, influential political friends who I'm sure will be helping push this in the right direction as well. So I think we're in a better position than we've ever been in, but we haven't won it yet, which is why it's so important to take part in the process. Even if you've said the same thing again and again and again, every five years going back uh, uh, to 2010. We, we have a question here. I'm not sure it's one for answering now. I'm just going to sort of write, uh, say um, we're, we're doing a lot of promotion on supporting the uh, Cotswold Canal Trust water transfer project. Um, and we have a question here, which is, are we making direct contact with those that have objected to the Oxfordshire Reservoir Programme uh, in favour of uh, the canal option. We haven't yet. It's a good point. We, I, I'm not sure how we'd go about that. I'll speak to Ken, Ken off. Um, no, I'm, quite, I'm, quite happy to, I'm quite happy to answer that. You've got an answer for that. Ken. I have got an answer. Um, the large reservoir at Abingdon is very, very fond to a lot of people in the water industry because they understand big reservoirs. And you can see why, because it basically captures water when there's plenty of it and decants it later. Um, no single scheme is going to be able to solve the problem. So if you have the Cotswold Canal scheme, it isn't necessarily going to stop or even be in competition with the reservoir. Um, only in a scenario where there was more water available than they thought and less demand than they thought, would it be possible to knock out either the Thames and Seven scheme or the reservoir scheme? We are clearly extolling the virtues of the Cotswold Canal Scheme over and above the Reservoir Scheme, um, but it is not our fight to try to uh, stop the reservoir, but we are pointing out that it's not necessarily the best thing to do, and particularly it's not the best thing to do now. And it may be possible for others to argue that the Cotswold Canal Scheme plus wastewater reuse, et cetera, et cetera, might be able to do the same job. The, the Seven Thames Transfer Scheme and the Reservoir both deliver about the same amount of water. So they are very equivalent. They're both strategic re resource option schemes. But as I say, from 2040 going forward, the uh, emerging plan has got both the Seven Thames Transfer and a Reservoir and a load of other stuff as well. Thank you, Ken. Um... One of uh, uh, one of our questions is around again is around the Sutton Tunnel. I'm drawn to it somehow. I don't know how. Um, so no, it, it's a worry relating to um, uh, getting large pipeline up to Sutton Portal and uh, how that might affect or damage the Sutton end of the valley floor and the woods around it. Well, lots of people put in pipelines, and and it's questionable where they would put it. And there is an argument for putting it smack up the middle of the canal bed and sorting out the leaks on that section of the canal at the same time, which would confine it basically to uh, uh, to to that. Um, but pipelines are put in and can be can be uh, implemented and, and the ground restored around them. Um, Without doing, you know, it's certainly not necessary to chop down Arthur Sickerish Wood to get this pipeline in, um, but it's up to them to decide what is the, the the best route for getting that pipeline up to the summit level, taking into account all the ecological constraints and the physical ones. Um, you know, in theory, it could be anywhere on the valley sides or in the valley floor or underneath the canal even. So um, that is something that they would need to look at. And there is some, some of the, at least one of the options they've been looking at has been, has been to take water in on a completely different route, not following the Stroud Valley at all, and putting it into the summit level. The disadvantage we're doing that is that you lose the benefit of putting the, uh, putting the water 
under the Cotswolds rather than over the Cotswolds. Um, at its deepest point, Sapton Tunnel is 240 feet below ground level. So you've got to go up, getting on for Arthur's match again to get over the top of the Cotswolds compared with uh, using the canal. Uh, using the canal means that you've got less carbon, less energy and all the rest of it needed to actually pump the water. So it swings and roundabouts, but um, you know it is possible to put pipelines through fairly sensitive places without creating a terrible mess. And certainly a lot of it could actually go underneath the, the canal or the side ponds in the upper part of the valley and avoid taking large numbers of trees out. Thank you, Tim. We've got time just for one, one more quick question um, before we um, uh, thank you for your time this evening. Um, and I think it's only fair to group two questions, both about the, apologies for my pronunciation, Clangothan. Clangothan. Thank you, Clangothan Canal, and how it compares with that as a project. Right, okay. Now the land Gothland Canal has been used for water transfer for many years. And the important thing to understand about the, that canal is that basically they chucked something like 54 megalitres a day into a very shallow, narrow canal, and they didn't put any infrastructure in to, to adjust to that. So on that canal, you're in a canal that's only two and a half foot deep instead of uh, four or five foot deep. We're talking about a canal that was built that in places is very narrow. It's not even capable of two-way traffic for seven foot beam boats. Um, and you've got long things like tunnels and aqueducts and stuff like that, where the, the boat is occluding quite a lot of the channel. Um, this is a much wider, much deeper canal. Um, and the flow rates generally will be fairly low. And as I've already said, um, when it comes to the tunnel, um, the aim would be to, uh, to take the water under the tunnel to avoid the flow. The big problems occur in long, narrow things, and the Land Auckland Canal has got lots of long, narrow things for the, uh, um, the flow coming in the opposite direction to cause problems with. You've got Chirk Tunnel, for example. Um, that's, a, that's another one. Um, but it's basically, when it comes to the, the normal flow rates, not a problem. The problem happens when you've got a boat that occludes most of the cross section of the channel and, you're, and the rest of the water is trying to go round you. Um, and if it can't get round you, you're going to get this head difference occurring across the, across the length of the boat. So um, that, that's really the situation there. It should be better, um, but the water transfer won't be running all the time. And uh, OK, maybe we'll get a little bit of hassle and it may be not quite as easy as it would be if you didn't have water transfer. But frankly, if you don't have water transfer, the probability is you're not going to be you're not going to be around by the time it fully gets restored. So you won't be able to use it anyway. That, that is a much, much bigger obstacle to navigation. Thank you very much, Ken. We really are going to be out of time very shortly. Um, we've uh, We've got all of the questions that have been asked by our participants this evening, uh, and we will ensure that those frequently asked questions are sent out in a group email um, to all those that participated, along with uh, a recording of this evening's webinar. Um, Amy, take... one, one thing quickly I didn't say and nobody's asked. Um, it is entirely likely that there will be a discussion at some point about how much of the canal is restored being paid for by the water companies and how much of the canal is going to be restored by others. Um, clearly, we'll be pressing as hard as possible for as much money as possible to, uh, to come in from, uh, from this particular source because of the value that it adds. Uh, but it is entirely possible that, uh, that at some point somebody will turn around and say, well, those locks that go down the Golden Valley are actually not in the bit of the canal that goes through to the Thames, which we're using for water transfer, is somebody else going to help pay for those? And that is a, another discussion for another time. Um, uh, but it's one that I think is probably inevitable. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, joining you in the fundraising for this incredible charity is something that I look forward to doing for the future, Ken. So anybody wants to talk to me about that, then you're more than welcome to give me a call in the office anytime. Um, but thank you very much, Ken.
fascinating as ever. I think everybody has sent in some really positive comments, really great questions. You've got until the 14th of this month. That's Monday. That's Monday to send in emails, responses, send them to us. If you can't figure out the system, we'll forward them on to you for you. Um, but thank you very much for those of you who have uh, uh, contributed to the consultation. It all goes towards the, the helpful part. And I've just had one uh, comment in the Q&A just saying fascinating. Thanks, Ken and Amy. And that's very nice of you to comment on my, uh, but it's all down to Ken. So thank you very much, Ken. I'll applaud yeah. you for everybody. And <laughs> look forward to catching up with you soon. I hope, hope to see people face to face. It's much, much nicer than a live audience. Although Absolutely. It's lovely to have over 100, 100 people actually watching and taking part. Thanks very much, Ken. Take care. See you soon. Bye.